your Bibles, and we're going to be reading from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew on the beginning at the 21st verse. Stand for the reading of the Gospel. Peter had just confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of the living God. And from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Our lesson this morning is uh, most revealing. It's about rewards. And knowing rewards will be given should make every believer want to become a better, more productive Christian, I would think. But there's a big difference between the doctrine of salvation for the lost and the doctrine of rewards for the saved. You see, salvation is a free gift of God. You can't earn it. It's not a works. Salvation, that is eternal life, is received by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But rewards are for those who already have believed and are given according to works. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, Father and his angels, and then he shall reward every person according to his works. Well, now, when that day comes, Christ will repay each Christian according to what he or she has done. That's what the Bible just said. And the clear implication is that those who have lived for themselves alone, they're going to repay, be repaid with judgment. That's their, going to, that's their reward. But those who have taken up the cross of self-denial to follow Jesus, they will receive a reward. And every believer receives eternal life. But not all believers will be rewarded with the crown of life. Rewards will only be given to those who continually serve Him. You see, when you live by faith, you walk in the favor and the blessing of God. You're in fellowship with Him. Your life is pleasing to Him. The Apostle James said in the first chapter, verse 12, said, Rewards are to be given to the one that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love Him. Now, when you look at that verse closely, you will discover that the believer finds strength 
to overcome temptation through difficulties. That's where you find the way to endure hardships is through difficulties because of God's love. Without His love in your heart, you might become bitter. You might even become critical. You might lose the crown of life. But you can have success enduring hardships if the love of God has been put into your spirit by the Holy Spirit. And to receive this free gift of God, you must have an enthusiastic love for the Lord. And Jesus made it even clearer when he described the death of self. The death of self. Well, what is self? Self is who you are. It's how you live your life. But whoever would save his life or her life will lose it. And those who willingly lose their lives for Jesus' sake will find true life. Well, let me tell you about a preacher who was standing at the church door, shaking hands as we do every Sunday. The congregation was departing. He took a man by the hand, pulled him aside and said, Sam, you need to join the army of the Lord. The man replied, Preacher, I'm already in the army of the Lord. <laughs> the preacher looked, looked puzzled. He said, Well, then how come, Sam, I, I, I don't see you except at Christmas and Easter? <laughs> he said, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> well, speaking of the army, Several years ago, a young man was called up to go to Iraq after we declared war on Saddam Hussein. And the problem for the young man was he didn't want to go. He said he hadn't joined the army to go to, uh, to, go to war. He joined because of the medical benefits, the pay, the, the free college tuition when he got out, the insurance Something's wrong with that kind of thinking because one of the primary functions of the military is to prepare for war. Armies don't exist just to pass out benefits. Those are the perks. Armies exist to deal with conflicts, defend the people, fight the enemy, and hopefully win against an evil force. But there are some people who join up hoping to get a free ride. That kind of attitude will undermine the military of any nation. And that kind of attitude will undermine any church. Too often, people join a church for the benefits. That is, the church looks at a person and says, you look like a Christian to us, so join us. Watch out for us and we'll watch out for you. Sounds good to me. Okay. So while membership in a church doesn't guarantee that someone is a Christian, they still expect Jesus to be there for them when they need him. But they're never there for him when he needs them. Now, going back to our gospel lessons of the past few weeks, Jesus had been with his disciples for two years. He had been training them. He had been teaching them, exposing them to God's power. They had listened as he shared his teachings, told his parables. They saw him heal the deaf. Have the mute speak, the lame to walk. They even saw him raise a little girl from the dead. And he fed 5,000 men along with their wives and children with five barley loaves and two small fish. They were out in a boat in a storm on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus came walking out to them on the water and climbed in the boat with them. And he stilled the storm by saying, peace be still. 
He sent his disciples out to villages to preach, to heal, to cast out demons. But now his time on earth was getting short. His arrest and crucifixion in Jerusalem were only a few weeks away. And Jesus had to make it clear to his disciples just how serious he was about the task he had given them. So the first thing he did was to lay the foundation of their allegiance to him. Now, you remember last week when you were here? He asked, who do men say that I am? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Well, never lost for words. Simon Peter stepped right up and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus praised Peter for that and then explained that he had one final battle to fight. He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things there at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and then he would be killed. But on the third day, he would be raised to life. Peter objected. Matthew 16, 22 tells us Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. You see, that wasn't what Peter had signed up for. To Peter, Jesus had to live. He wasn't supposed to die. And that's what our text is teaching today. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's as if Jesus had said, I've called you to a war, and in that war you will face the possibility of death. Well, that's what worried that young man about going to Iraq. He knew that once he was in the trenches, he was going to face suffering, danger. He, he could even die. He didn't want that. And here Jesus was telling his disciples and us, but that's what you signed up for. John Wesley once said, Give me a hundred men who love nothing but God and hate nothing but sin, and I will shake the whole world for Christ. You see, it doesn't take many. But it does take someone who will decide to be faithful. December 1944, the German, Ar German army had launched an unexpected attack known as the Battle of the Bulge. It was a surprise attack by the German forces on the Allied troops in Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. That battle lasted for a month and ended with an Allied counteroffensive forcing the German withdrawal and was led by General George Patton. It was the largest, bloodiest battle fought by the United States in World War II. The Nazis had driven deep behind the Allied lines, and their objective was to deny further use of Belgian port of Antwerp and to split the Allied lines. The Bulge was the last chance for the German army to create a situation that would force some form of negotiation that might have blocked the invasion of Europe and the destruction of Germany itself. That didn't happen. James Jones, writing about the American troops in that time, that battle, said, the Americans decided to be faithful against that attack. Not one little road not one intersection in that battle 
happened that would have had a profound effect on the German drive. Little battles at intersections of little roads, little bitty battles. Hundreds of spur of the moment little battles at nameless bridges and unknown cross crossroads had the effect of enormously slowing the German army down. And those little die hard one man stands alone in the snow and the fog without communication would prove enormously effective, all out of proportion to their size. And my friends, that's where we are with our church today. We're fighting a war, all out of proportion against our enemy, Satan. If we beat him, we win. And the only way to beat him is by winning our little spur-of-the-moment battles. Yes, serving the Lord can be overwhelming at times, standing 30 feet high in the air, pressure washing the church, <laughs> pressure washing the sides of the church every year, unloading a big box truck, every Wednesday morning at 8.30 a.m., or a little before maybe, that's loaded with food, which needs to be sorted, prepared in an hour to distribute to over 120 families in our community. Serving on a church committee. Singing solo special music in church during Sunday service. Or driving people to their doctor when there's no one else to do it. Providing funds for abused women and children. Funding a, funding a school in Baja, Mexico. Helping someone make repairs to their home after a storm when they can't do it physically anymore. Preparing dishes for our Sunday lunches. Just asking if there's anything you can do. You see, sometimes you may think what you're doing really doesn't make any difference. It doesn't seem like anybody cares. It's small. You can feel like you're doing it all along. It's when we turn hearts around and have the lost want to become born again believers in Jesus Christ and become a part of the church. That's when we win. We must bring them to Jesus and be saved. We must do this. And that's the challenge to you as a soldier of the cross. You joined up to be a part of this church. And it's a big job. Keep soldiering on. That's a phrase often used to encourage someone to continue working hard, sticking through difficult times. It's a phrase used in the military. And it's become a popular saying used in everyday life. Use the phrase, keep soldiering on, to encourage someone, encourage someone who's struggling with life. Someone who's going through a a tough time. Use the phrase, keep soldiering on to encourage them to keep on going. I know things are tough right now, but you just need to keep soldiering on. You'll get through this. If you're working hard to achieve a goal or overcome a challenge in your own life, use a phrase on yourself to keep soldiering on. It will help you keep your determination. I've been working on this for months, but I'm going to keep soldiering on until I finish it. Use it when you're writing to someone who's going through a difficult time. You might write, I know things are tough right now. But just remember to keep soldiering on. You're stronger than you think you are. You see, overall... 
that phrase, keep soldiering on, sends a powerful message. It's one of staying power. It has strength. Whether you use it, use it to encourage someone else or whether you use it for yourself and your own experience, it's a phrase that can inspire. It can, it can motivate you to keep going, even though things get tough. So the next time you need to offer words of encouragement to someone or to yourself, remembering, keep soldiering on, and you shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. It's by your faithfulness that God wins your battles for you. Because the Son of Man is going to come in His glory, in His Father's glory, and with His angels. And then He reward, will reward each person according to what they've done. Amen.